Good day, everyone. My name is David Williams, Executive Director of the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Energy Markets. It is a, it's a two-part series with actually four separate webinars taking place uh, on this topic. Today's webinar is entitled Electricity Markets Assessment Europe and the US. We're grateful to our moderator, Dr. Jean-Michel Glachant, from the Florence School of Regulation for today's timely discussion. But first, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest association specializing in the field of energy economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations, along with a host of other products and services that you can find at our website at www.iaee.org. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our moderator. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have questions for our panelists, please use Zoom's Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window to post your question. We've allocated sufficient time to address your questions. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Jean-Michel Gauchon, Director of the Florence School of Regulation at the European Institute in Italy. Jean-Michel, over to you. I restart, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy, very joyful even to welcome hundreds of participants and many authors of this handbook. In this session, one hour, we will discuss Europe. You will see a strange Europe. It will start with David Nobeli, UK, the, the pioneer into uh, creating open wholesale markets and retail in Europe. Then we'll go to Chloe, Chloe Lecoq, to get the Nordic model of wholesale. And then Fabien will tell us if we have already, or I'm going to have a European common model. By European E, we will mean European Union, and if it works or not. And then we will have a surprise European, Australia, being, being European by culture, but being, uh, you know, three independent. And I will call Australia the Texas model because they have their very particular way of, of opening and making their wholesale markets work. Each will speak, I hope, six minutes. I will push this to 30 minutes for the four if I feel the need of one or two clarification. And then I will jump to the questions. All of you, all of you, the participants, you can ask questions in the Q&A box. The chat box is closed. And I will give you priority to, as, as questions because it is for you, this uh, session. It's not for us. We know each other already. Ready? One, two, three. David, you have the floor. You are the UK model. Six minutes. Thank you very much, Jean-Michel. So um, let me quickly say we had a minor strike. You can see the fuel share, the coal collapsed as we fortunately had enough oil. Arguably that precipitated the privatization wave of Margaret Thatcher. So we privatized the electricity industry in 1990 with a pool and central dispatch. Um, unfortunately, we created a duopoly and that created um, uh, dissatisfaction amongst the regulator and the parliament. So they changed to a, an energy only market, the new electricity trading arrangements in 2001. Um, as you can see, uh, gas thrived on that, but renewables did not. Uh, and eventually there was so little investment that the market was reformed yet again. So, uh, the key events I'm going to talk about very briefly is the privatization demonstrated that private owners are indeed more efficient than public, particularly when it comes to timely investment in cheap capital. But the cost of capital is roughly double what it had been in the private sector. Uh, and even then, um, the early entry was backed by long term power purchase agreements, long term contracts. And we, of course, developed a system of incentive regulation. <clears throat> we were lucky 
that in 1989, when it was privatized, the combined cycle gas turbines were cheap, coal was costly, and so entry on these contracts took place, um, <clears throat> and it worked very well. Uh, but unfortunately, we had a duopoly uh, that led to high prices, high margins, and lots of overinvestment in gas. Uh, the overcapacity created competition. Competition drove the margins down. But by then, it was too late to convince people that the market would work competitively. So we had this new trading arrangements that failed to deliver the investment to replace the aging coal plant in particular and the retiring nuclear plant, and it failed to deliver the kind of target renewables we needed. Uh, so we had a, a market reform in 2011. Uh, this shows you the evolution of the wholesale price, the costs of fuel. You can see this gap opening up, <clears throat> um, but you can also see concentration here falling as people sold plant and new entry came in. And eventually this margin was such that probably we would have had a competitive market without that. But quite clearly we've had an exciting time with margins not so um, high, uh, but of course the fuel price is changing a lot. <clears throat> so we had the market reform for the reasons I've explained. Um, and to do that, we introduced capacity payments. Uh, we set a carbon price floor to try and make renewables and nuclear power feasible. Um, and we introduced long-term contracts to de-risk renewable electricity. Uh, and that, as the fuel shares at the very beginning showed, seems to have been very successful. <clears throat> so what are the lessons? Um, I think GB, because we've tried three market designs now, it gives you a lot of evidence on what works and what doesn't. <clears throat> I think we've improved renewable support, but it could be improved further. Um, we've discovered that durable investment uh, gas-fired turbines don't last more than about 20, 25 years. If you want things like a combined capture and storage and nuclear plant, you need long-term contractual support. And we are inching towards a system that might deliver it, but we haven't got there yet. Uh, we, I think, have been good at assuring investors in networks that the regulation works and gives them a credible return. Um, we, I think, have been innovative in supporting um, the move to the smart network economy, um, perhaps the regulator has been less swift at adapting to a rapidly changing market. So I think what we're doing is moving to a better balance of competition, not just in the market, but for the market, uh, with new entry supported by long-term contracts and pop, perhaps, perhaps regulatory asset-based finance. So thank you very much, John michel Wonderful, David, many thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. So you have seen that UK, the pioneer, has had two to three different models. And now you, we are going to see the Nordic and you can be prepared to see the Nordic as closer to the common European type of market because the pioneer has not really be, been really copied, but the Nordic has been more. But what is a more Nordic model? You will know from Chloe. Chloe, you have the floor. You are Sorry, not unmuted. Me, yeah, yeah, go. Exactly. So you see my screen, right? My full screen. Can you confirm? Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar. Uh, looking forward to uh, uh, the discussion later on. And thank you, uh, Jean-Michel, for the introduction. So yeah, let's uh, so briefly present uh, or summarize the Nordic electricity market. So this is a joint uh, work with uh, Sebastian Schoen. And, and, and really, uh, just to go fast, I thought, OK, I think the Nordic market can be characterized with um, by three dimension, right? The first one, obviously, is uh, this is, I think, the first uh, multinational electricity market that was implemented. So in a sense, that was that's interesting also for Europe, but also uh, in US or in other part of the world, because it was a common market. And first, you had Norway and Sweden joining, and then fi Finland in 98, and then Denmark by step, 1999, 2000, and then 
finally the Baltic state. And we see that indeed the Nordic market is growing and then connecting a lot uh, with them. Uh, Germany and UK and so on. Uh, what is interesting in terms of governments also, I think, is that that's, you, you could see that there was some adjustment on the national regulation in order to make sure that this common market was working, uh, not, only, not only technically, but in terms of regulation. So I think that's that's one of the main characteristics. Um, the second um, characteristic is, is this zonal pricing. So the Nordic market has a zonal pricing. You Currently, we have a uh, 15 price zone, and the configuration of the zone follows somehow the national border. But uh, you see, for example, that uh, you have uh, uh, so in Finland, you only have one zone, while in Sweden, you have four zones, in, in Denmark, five, uh, two, and then in Norway, five. But this is also not set, so this can change also. But so far, this is what we have, 15 zone. So that's the second characteristic, I think, for the Nordic, that we have zonal pricing implemented and then um, also affecting the uh, end user price. The third uh, characteristic is really the dominance of the hydropower. So uh, if you count on the Nordic market, this is about 50% of the total production. And uh, this is obviously has some impact again on the price. Uh, definitely uh, the reservoir inflow are, are really a, a, an important variable when you want to understand the fluctuation of the price and what's going on. But it's also important, and I'm sure we will discuss this if we increase the renewable share uh, later on in the whole Europe. Uh, I want to also mention that uh, nuclear power is also important technology. It's about 20% of the total production, right? So I would say those three characteristics are, are one way to summarize the Nordic market. I, I will also would like to outline, just like David did just um, briefly now for UK, I, I want to do it for the Nordic. It's like there is also, I think, three issues three issues right now uh, for the Nordic uh, model. Uh, the first is, is really uh, the nuclear. It's quite uncertain. Uh, so Finland has decided to invest in nuclear, but uh, you know, uh, Okilogto has been, was supposed to run in 2009 and now it's, it's scheduled June 22. So it's, it's, it has taken a lot of time. Uh, in Sweden, uh, there is this discussion about whether um, Swedish nuclear reactor will may need to close between 2004 and 2008, right? So it's uncertain. We were waiting for a decision in the end of August. It's still really not clear what's going on in uh, 24. So this is meaning tomorrow. And again, it most likely we need nuclear uh, if we want to decarbonize the uh, economy. The th second issue is uh, you have this grid certificate scheme um, uh, that is between Norway and Sweden. And, and the question is, uh, okay, if you have a quota system and you have um, this idea that you, you kind of get some price in order to invest and renewable and, and, and motivate re renewable, the problem is that uh, can this help decarbonize the, the whole economy? Uh, what happened uh, if it's too low price? There is this discussion of whether this, uh, even this green certificate will be stopped in December uh, 2030, right? So this is an open question. Do we need it to have it furthermore? And finally, the third question, uh, third issue is uh, it, there's been a big talk about, so we, all the, almost all the Nordic uh, country want a fossil free, want to be fossil free by 2050. Uh, so a natural question is, is it realistic? And do we need to have capacity mechanism in order to make sure that we have this? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chloe. So Chloe is telling, yes, we have had a Nordic model, but uh, it's future, we do not know. Well, David was saying, we know a bit about the future of the UK model. So now, Fabien, uh, where are we? Do we have a European something being a model? Uh, don't we? Uh, does it deliver? Uh, what are the main issues at the European level? Thank you, Jean-Michel. Good afternoon, all. I hope you can see my screen. Um, 
So essentially, I'm going to talk about the process for integrating EU markets and where we see them going next. Um, so very quickly, I'm going to perhaps surprise you, but I'm going to start by saying, yes, we have managed largely to integrate all national markets into uh, EU market, but we have not succeeded in integrating what is very important, uh, the underlying approaches for security of supply and for choosing technologies uh, which are being supported by policymakers. These are two maps of Europe where you see uh, a patchwork of colors. On the left hand side, you see capacity mechanisms, either capacity markets, strategic reserve capacity payments, you see that there is not, uh, I would say, a, a coordinated approach, clearly far from that across countries. If you look on the, on the right hand side, you, you can see that there are also, um, I would say, big differences in the way countries support via long-term contracts, renewables. So this is where we are. And the other thing that we need to, I think, recognize um, is that we have um, significantly changed in, in the background. So the current market model in Europe, uh, at least the one that's been defended by the European Commission, uh, has its roots in the 1990s or early 2000s. Technologies, consumers, and policy objectives have changed. Uh, on the policy side, the focus was very much on ensuring competition um, and ensuring, uh, obviously, cr efficient cross-border participation. Now the focus is very much on decarbonization. I'll come back to that in a minute. It has important implications. The focus was very much also on the day ahead market. With renewables being deployed, the focus is now turning to real time. Technologies were essentially viable cost technologies. Uh, we have the dash for gas in some countries. Now we have a dominance of fixed cost technologies. Consumers used to be passive. They are a lot more active now and networks need also to be significantly upgraded. Um, so if we go to the, to the challenge associated with decarbonization, um, I think what I'd like to emphasize is, well, one staggering figure. Uh, you see here the need for investment in gigawatts. Uh, clearly, this is a different scale compared to what we have done historically in Europe with uh, decarbonization objectives. But the other thing you can see on that slide is that the vast majority of the mix of plants we have today in the system were built either under monopolies or under some form of de-risking mechanism, be it a long-term contract or some form of capacity remuneration schemes that ensured um, a predictability of revenues. So that leads me uh, to my next point, which is essentially that we are seeing the emergence uh, in Europe already of what um, I think David called, uh, you know, competition for the market, followed by competition in the market. Um, what we are most used to dealing with is competition in the market. It relies on a set of integrated markets. We are still working on this integration closer to real time. Uh, but what we have not progressed to date much in Europe is this competition for the market issue. Uh, we have a patchwork of approaches on a national basis. Um, and clearly, uh, that's probably where our efforts need to, uh, need to focus in the next years. And I'll conclude with the last slide on, on that front to highlight some of the challenges I see ahead. Um, so I see three main issues in implementing uh, a common approach at the EU level, or at least some common principles, let's put it this way. In these hybrid markets that we see emerging uh, across Europe, there are three main steps. A step for the definition of the system needs. You can call it planning, uh, or you can call it definition of system needs. But essentially, it's about uh, identifying what is going to be needed in the power system of tomorrow to operate safely and to meet the policy decarbonization objectives. There is a second step that's about competition for the market. So it's about the contracting, the hedging mechanisms. It's about the design of these long-term contracts and products. It's about the way you want to auction for this and the design of the auction. So there are plenty of interesting issues for um, economists. 
The last step is the one we know best. Um, it's the issue of um, ensuring efficiency uh, in the short term, but it's also um, casting a new light on it. The issue of how do you uh, make sure that you um, have an efficient short term operation despite all of these, I would say, long term contracts overlaid on it. Um, so that's my contribution to the debate, and I look forward to uh, the discussion. I've seen that the three speakers nicely speak to each other, and Fabien is saying that uh, EU as a whole look like the Nordics. Uh, we did something, but uh, our future is unclear. But this is Europe in a narrow sense, because why not to look at Australia, a full continent, and something else? And is Australia following uh, this type of uh, European contract of this, contract of that, or as a more relaxed approach, we will know from Paul. Paul, you have the floor. And you are really from Australia, so you can look at your clock to see what time it is in Australia. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Yes, good evening, everybody. It's, it's, uh, it's very early in the morning where I am at the moment, uh, border, just uh, 20 past 12. Um, let me just start by giving a quick orientation and then I'll put some slides up uh, just to, to put a bit of colour around things. So for those of you who aren't familiar, the national electricity market is actually uh, covers Australia's eastern seaboard. So it doesn't cover the whole country just because of uh, geography. Uh, but you're talking the, the major capital cities, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide. Ratcheted uh, peak demand is about 35,000 megawatts and, and about 200 terawatt hours of energy per annum. In terms of the population, you're talking about 23 million people or 10 million household accounts and about a million businesses. Historically, the market's been very much coal dominated. Um, and I guess the great challenge for the industry here is trying to navigate uh, climate change imperatives in, in an environment where you've got two warring factions from a, from a uh, climate change uh, policy perspective. There really has been dreadful discontinuity and, and the Industry is sort of at a state of despair trying to interpret that. Uh, nonetheless, um, the market now has 30% renewable market share across uh, the market. And you, I'm sure some of you would be aware, South Australia is closing in on 60% renewables. Probably the other really notable feature about uh, the NEM at the moment is that uh, you know, regions like the Queensland region, uh, you have 40% of households have a rooftop solar PV. So I'll say that again, 40% of all uh, houses in, in Queensland have a, a rooftop solar PV and in some cases they're looking a lot more like uh, power stations than a, than a little boutique uh, rooftop application. So some quite large systems going on. Now the Australian market experiment really started in the mid-1990s. It was largely stylized on the British model generation being petitioned and unlike Great Britain though, the, the restructuring of the generators was done pretty well. So we didn't have quite have the same market power issues that David referred to in his, uh, in his discussion. And similarly on, on the distribution side, you know, retail and distribution were stapled together until the capital markets uh, forced that separation. I guess the centrepiece of the Australian reforms though was really the wholesale market. It's a, it's a real time gross pool energy only market with a very high value of loss load. So $15,000 market price cap, and there aren't any real restrictions on generators bidding so that you're not obliged to bid at your marginal cost. You're free to bid at whatever price you see fit. What regulates participants is just the sheer volume of competition in the market. And the prices are actually settled. Uh, you know, resolution is five minutes and settlement is on a five minute basis. So just to be clear, there's no formal day ahead market and there never has been. And there's no formal capacity market mechanism. Um, and, it, and it really comes down to, you know, capacity being guided by our forward markets for contracts and they're traded very actively so you know four to five hundred percent of physical uh trade so by the time each megawatt has been consumed it's been bought and sold four or five times over um, largely through two-way and one-way cfds or swaps and caps as we as we refer to them as um, and these days a surprising number of, of long dated ppas are being traded so that's the overview. So then I guess, um, uh, has the market been successful? Um, look, I, I mean, I, my sort of, uh, uh, sort of considered view was in the main it has. And I'm just going to bring up a, a slide for you. Hopefully you can all see this. Um, if I can get my slide to go forward one. There we go. So 
So this shows you just in, in, in nominal dollars, the dotted line there shows you the, uh, you know, the approximate entry cost and the, and the solid line there shows you the wholesale market price, a couple of excursions. Um, probably the more interesting thing though is to actually look at the, at the run of, of investment into the marketplace. So there's those two lines again. Initially, there was a wave of coal then a wave of gas generation and more recently, a huge amount of renewables coming into the market in spite of the fact that, you know, all the policy mechanisms have largely been exhausted. So about $57 billion worth of new plan into, into, into the market, 32,000 megawatts across 230 30 projects. And really the, um, the handful of price excursions you can see in there have really been driven by sort of acute weather uh, events, you know, sort of drought type conditions. Um, or the most recent one was really an episode of disorderly coal plant exit. Um, look, I've had people argue that a capacity market might have, um, you know, sort of defused some of that most recent disorderly exit. Um, what I can tell you is, is that um, uh, an, only a capacity market where, you know, the, the, uh, the central buyer wildly overpurchased would you have avoided those, those issues. There were forces well beyond a, a, what a capacity market could have coped with. Just in terms of networks, just touching on those really fleetingly, they're largely CPI minus X revenue cap regulated much in, in, in the spirit of, of, of uh, Great Britain and, and Little Child's work. There were episodes of overinvestment. Um, what sorted that out, to be honest, was the low interest rate environment and a stiff response from the regulator. And since then, network tariffs have subsided. And just in terms of the retail market, uh, contestability and, and full retail competition was a a complex rollout because you had, you know, sort of five participating state governments and they rolled that out at different rates. I guess what's been the most surprising about it is though is the competition has been workable, rusted on customers or those that are really sticky and haven't never really moved it are down to less than 10% of the market. So out of the 10 million households, more than 9 million of them have shopped around at some point or another with quite high switching rates. Um, as is often the case though, um, price discrimination got conflated with rising prices um, and, the, and the market ended up being re-regulated. If you were trying to sit back and think about what are the key lessons that you'd learn out of, out of the Australian experiment and some of the things that went wrong and obviously over a six minute period, I can't dive into those in great detail, but I guess a couple of key things were um, ideally trying to align climate change policy with energy policy. It just makes life so much easier for market participants. I think um, thinking through really carefully, if you start seeing lots of renewable coming in, uh, you know, the merit order effects initially follow, um, you can expect sooner or later, you know, legacy plants gonna need to leave and you need to think through very carefully, what does it mean when those key plants leave the market? Um, sometimes it's, it's, you know, a rise in prices. Other times it's the loss of power system strength or, you know, uh, high volts or whatever the case may be as a result of what comes in after it. I think in our market, price discrimination and vertical practices were grossly overdiagnosed, but above all, our gross pool energy only market um, has, has proved to be you know, remarkably resilient. You know, the rise of zero marginal running cost renewables obviously put that to the test, but um, uh, my expectation is it's got a, another, you know, sort of at, at least another handful of years to go before we really need to stop them. I'm done. Thank you. So, uh, Michelle, that was my last thank point. you. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, but I will ask David, Chloe, Fabien, do you feel challenged by Australia or Paul? Or uh, do you, do, could, could you easily explain why it works and why it works while doing it differently? David. Well, I'm amazed it works given, as Paul said, the chaos over climate change plans. But I assume that that renewables entry was all based on uh, long-term contracts. Uh, so the big problem has been coordinating the coal investment or the lack of it or the phasing out to a more flexible demand um, supply and response system. Um, but uh, it's an impressive achievement. Thank you, David. Chloe, price zone, no price zone? I'm, I'm, I will also actually will like to hear about the demand side. So is it the demand really responsive? That's why uh, you have kind of a backup or, or that uh, in, in, uh, in this market? Paul? I will ask Paul. Yeah, Chloe, I think, look, to be honest, the, the, the reason that reliability and, and prices have been you know, restrained reasonably well is uh, there is nothing like a $15,000 price spike 
uh, to get the attention of, uh, of market participants up and down the supply chain. The more interesting thing has been, I think, and, and David's question is, is probably the really uh, the, the important one as well, is how have we managed to sort of um, uh, muddle through when you've got warring tribes over climate change policy? Um, and I think a couple of things. First of all, you know, the renewable uh, entry costs have just plunged in a way that's hard to get your head around in our, in our country. The other thing is, too, is that capital markets and supply chains have taken over. They've ignored, they're ignoring what Canberra, you know, our politicians are saying, and they're just going to work um, and, and they're just demanding action, so to speak. And, uh, you know, I, I guess that's, um, you know, for now that's working. Long may it continue. Thank you, Paul. Fabien, challenge or uh, easy to live with? Well, I've, I have a couple of questions for you, Paul, because, I mean, Australia has always been a, a model, if you want, uh, or, or a template for, for us Europeans. First question, uh, what is the legacy, if any, of the blackout you had in the South um, a couple of years ago? Our policymakers um, and, and, you know, the public, I would say, opinion still in favor of, of you know, markets. So that's my first question. Uh, second one, could you anticipate a shift in the next years? You mentioned that, that the current market has proven resilient and has probably a few more years to come. Uh, but, but, you know, as you will start to see the effect of renewables on the conventional fleet, and some of these will, you know, start to retire. Could you see the kind of, you know, shift of, of you know, opinion and power, um, you know, having an effect on, on this market? Yeah, good questions as well. So, so look, maybe if I just talk about the South Australian blackout, first of all. So that, that um, obviously occurred in September 2016. And I guess the key thing about that blackout was, and, and I'm going to pinpoint two, two issues in particular. One was the uh, control settings inside four wind farms, which were all doing the same thing and were probably shouldn't have been set the way they were. The second thing was, as you start losing more and more of your conventional plant, as it turns out, um, inertia is pretty valuable. And when you don't have it, you find out uh, what happens when things go wrong. So in this particular day, you had, a, you know, in, in a fairly, it's the smallest region of the NAM, really. There's only peak demand on a, on a hot day, is 3,000. And on a day like the day that it occurred, it was about 1,800 megawatts. Ironically, there was a giant storm heading towards the coastline and for some unknown reason, the system operator, AEMO, had the inner connector with Victoria fully loaded at the time. So it's a, a mystery. Um, the storm comes in, taps out a, a few transmission lines, um, four wind farms respond to it and disconnect. Uh, and then as it turns out, there just weren't enough uh, um, uh, spinning generators to keep the system whole. The interconnector immediately jumped by hundreds of megawatts and then worked out it was well above its rate of capacity and disconnected. The rate of change of frequency at that point was declining at the rate of 7.5 hertz um, uh, per second. Under frequency load shedding or the old, you know, sort of automated blackout button that we like to apply can generally arrest a rate of change of frequency of around about 3.5 hertz per second. So it was... The system was collapsing at twice the, the rate at which the last line of defence would respond. And consequently, in the space of you know, two seconds, you went from a stable system to a, a black system event. Um, it, so the speed of that collapse was, was, was extraordinary. Um, and I don't think anything in the market design uh, per se would have stopped it. What we do need to do now, though, is to... Oh, well, actually, that's not quite true, Fabian. I think... The point there then becomes, have we got enough ancillary services, frequency control ancillary services at our disposal? Do we have enough spinning machines? And if we don't have those, what, what are we putting in place of those? And of course, since then, a range of synchronous condensers have been put into the marketplace and we're just getting ready to roll out a fast frequency response market after me being educated by David Newbury on such matters and actually submitting a rule change, which was recently accepted. Um, on the, uh, on the second question, Fabian, uh, you know, how are the, you know, is the market sort of resilient and, and how are the coal plants or other plants um, coping with that? That was the question was, have I got that right? Yeah, so, so look, I think, um, uh, um, 
the, the large coal generators are starting to struggle. And, and where you start seeing that most acutely is minimum loads. We're just getting so much solar coming in and cannibalising the daytime um, system load that it's actually starting to become difficult for those machines to hang in there. And I think um, that will happen at differential rates across the market. Interestingly enough, what brought all of these disparate warring tribes or the, the Queensland states together, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a, 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 federal, a federal system. So you've got Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria South. They all had to sign up to this national market to begin with. And the fact that they did was a, was a, was a miracle. But what brought them together was they had a common problem. You know, they were all oversupplied. All the things that uh, Richard uh, uh, has written about in, in his chapter. I think um, uh, the, the issues facing all of the states now are all radically different. And my expectation is our market will actually disintegrate over time because the challenges facing each of the regions are just so different from each other. To give you the obvious example, you know, South Australia is now... 60% renewable market share. It's got no coal plant left, um, just a bit of gas-fired generation of which is not terribly reliable. Go up to somewhere like Queensland, much larger system, great big mix of coal, gas, renewables, big interconnectors, uh, lots of load coming in and out and so on. So their uh, their challenges are just, just at, at different ends of the spectrum. And I think the thing that will end up um, disintegrating um, will be the, you know, the edges of, of the market. Um, and hopefully we'll hang on to that little dispatch algorithm in the middle. Uh, that'll be the thing that'll, that will still withstand. Back to the more traditional parts of Europe. A question from the floor. Uh, how would you decide that this or that is or has been a success regarding these market models? And I will ask to David, Chloe, and Fabien. And I will add uh, my uh, French touch. And uh, do you think that the current response to the crisis in the gas market or in the electricity market, let's say the European energy crisis, do you think that the response today is a criterion to judge the, the market model or not at all? David. Well, a successful market delivers the right investment at the right time of the right kind at the right price to the consumers. Uh, that's a tall order. I think um, we've had mixed success. I think um, <clears throat> uh, the, um, we've discovered, I think, that too little competition produces quite a lot of investment, but high prices and arguably excess investment. Uh, too much competition arguably deters all subsequent investment uh, without long-term contracts. We did initially have long-term contracts. We've now reintroduced those. So as Papiano said, it's the mixture of competition in the market and for the market. As to the gas crisis, what I find very interesting is people are complaining in Britain about the lack of storage. The supply of gas is not the problem. There's just an international price that is horrendously high. And Unless um, you, and I think this is a challenge for regulators, um, if the retail market is sufficiently forwardly hedged, um, then perhaps those price spikes are not so important. But at the moment, if you ask, would you renew a two-year contract at current gas prices on the forward curve? Terrifying. Um, so uh, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. Very good. Chloe? Yeah. Okay. So, what is the success? Also, I agree, of course, with David. No, so, so uh, a French answer will be no yellow vest on the street. That will be also important. <laughs> a right? bit French. Uh, uh, a bit French, but still. Uh, so, and this is connected. So, of course, you want the right investment at the right time. You want, uh, but you also want the short-term price to make sure that you're competitive um, for your industry, and you see all the exemption as soon as we put. Uh, any certificate, like for example, in Sweden, green certificate, the, the industrial uh, consumers are exempt, for example. Is it fair, not fair? Is it the right price? Well, it, it depends on your objective, I would say. But, uh, uh, and, and yes, uh, regarding the gas prime, I, th I think there's a, an issue here is that when you see what's going on in the gas market, and we have to realize that this, this has been a change quite significantly in the gas market in terms of the contract are shorter, uh, we changed the 
it used to be indexed to the old price. Now you have a hub and then you, you have, so it is much more liquid market and much more sensitive to demand and supply. So to some extent for me, um, my understanding of what's going on is also a change of market structure and we should get used to it. That, that would be my answer. It's, it's been a change. Uh, you see that uh, there is much more spot or wool sell gas price uh, or, and, and, and this affects also the price. So it's more, much more viability. Thank you. Fair enough. Fabien. Well, Jean-Michel, I'm sure you'll recognize yourself in what I'm going to say, but, but taking a, an institutional... No, not really. <laughs> taking a, an institutional view on these issues, I mean, um, what, what is a market for and, and how do you assess its efficiency? I think... Uh, you don't do that in a vacuum, right? Uh, you, you look at the, the set of technologies you have, you let look at the um, policy objectives. And, and I think, um, well, these have changed significantly. So what I think we can say safely is that the markets we have have delivered well on what they were set out to do, meaning ensuring short-term uh, allocative efficiency. Now we are setting ourselves for a new challenge, at least uh, in Europe, which is a very significant wave of investment. And what's going to matter most is markets that can deliver that long-term allocative efficiency. And this is why I think we are, we are discussing um, potentially this competition in two steps, because the first step, competition for the market, is the one that is missing to, to deliver that, that long-term allocative efficiency. Wow, sophisticated, but uh, I can swallow it. Uh, by the way, I'm taking the next question for the box. And the next question was, but is it, is it the market model, the key issue of the resources of the country, of the set of countries? If the set of countries have hydro uh, and uh, nuclear, do they work the same way that they have entirely fossil fuel or another country entirely renewables, et cetera, et cetera? Are the, the basic resources key in the success of this or that model? Will we start the same? David? Um, sorry, can you repeat that last thing about the same? Yeah, of course. Um, the Nordic are claiming we have hydro and nuclear. Right. A, part, a, a participant was saying in this country, it's mainly fossil fuels. Another can say in my country, we have 60%, 70% renewables. Are, are these, these uh, resources more important than the model or as important as the model to explain the outcome? Well, I think if you have a lot of storage hydro, then adding renewables, variable renewables, is extremely simple. And the SEM, the single electricity market at the island of Ireland, is at the other extreme of having hardly any storage hydro. There's a pump storage scheme, uh, a small and moderately isolated market with a high penetration of wind. Um, and that is seriously challenging. Um, and it clearly needs flexible generation or a huge amount of interconnection. Uh, the analysis I've done suggests the interconnection is a mixed blessing because when it's windy in Ireland, it's windy in England. And when it's windy in England, it's usually windy in France and Germany. So uh, you have either too much or too little over a wide area. Uh, so it's a serious challenge. It's much nicer to be in a country which has lots and lots of water. <laughs> is that to put in the whiskey or to put in the, in the balancing of the system? Do you agree with this, Chloe? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think uh, that's why also uh, Nordic countries are so ambitious in terms of of their um, fossil free uh, economy and so it, it's credible. So I, I think it's credible. So you can, so the, the problem is like uh, maybe is uh, idle power actors can be strategic on the market. So still raise the price. Well, they can if, if there are not too many, if, if suddenly the Nordic uh, market is really integrated to Europe and, and, and here there's this opportunity cost that can play a role even with hydro, but otherwise, yeah, of course, resources. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen Norwegian protesting about against the exportation to, to continental Europe. Fabien? 
Yeah, just to add to that, I think um, obviously the different sources of electricity have different value from a system point of view, uh, meaning some of it is firm, some of it is flexible, some of it is viable. Um, and, and I think what's key is that the market design will reward properly uh, the respective contribution of these different energy sources. But, but there is more. There is also, I think, um, the broader concept of uh, energy independence. And, and I think in the question, there was also that, that question about relying on, on domestic sources. And I think it ties nicely with that, that example you gave. How much do you want to export of your precious hydro if you are in the, in the Nordics? Um, that, that is you know, a big political question. Interesting. We are jumping to the next question in the Q&A box. Zonal. Uh, does it make still big sense, zonal, with more renewable? Or uh, should we go for a bit of nodal? Or uh, how do you see that? And then we will go everywhere. We will start with David. Uh, up to him to find what to say. Then we'll go to Chloe, to Fabien, and we'll be back to Paul. Not okay, all, so, not all. Um, my, uh, the analysis we've done in, in the SEM in Ireland is the cost of moving to nodal is too high compared to the benefits. And the political costs of where we do ideally have two zones, it's unfortunately at the north-south boundary. And uh, Boundaries on the island are really problematic. Uh, the same arguably is true in Great Britain, where the obvious boundary is between Scotland and England. Uh, so these things are fraught, and arguably at least the nodal price gets away from those political dimensions. <laughs> I won't say anything because I do respect Great Britain. Chloe. Uh, does it make a, a economic sense? Uh, in some sense, a real preference uh, will show us that, uh, yes, zonal price makes sense. Uh, I don't know if it makes economic sense uh, for sure. My understanding is that um, nodal pricing might be uh, the ultimate um, best option. But then again, I, I would like to bring back the, the demand. If we have, um, you need to have the information and you need to deliver and you need, I believe, uh, quite a strong elastic uh, demand in order to benefit from the nodal price, because there are some costs also implementing this. Fabien? Yeah, I can, I can only agree. I mean, obviously, we need um, finer price signals in terms of uh, geographic granularity in, in Europe. Um, whether you call that nodal, um, as, as in the US, or, or and whether this is done in the same way, um, is, is a question we've been debated for, debating for 20 years. Uh, I think the big issue you, is that- You were debating it 20 years ago? I'm, I'm not sure, Fabien. Maybe not me, but, but some of my uh, <laughs> you know, spiritual fathers uh, on this call uh, will, uh, will recognize themselves. But, but long story short, I think the key question is, um, can we find a way to make uh, these you know, nodal prices um, compatible with the EU model? Let, let's remember that you know, we don't have central dispatch in big part of Europe, um, and, and we have TSOs, not ISOs, so uh, a lot of that coordination between market and, and system is, is you know, taking a very different light compared to the, to the US. And as David said, the transition cost would be enormous. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have locational prices. I think we should have, but, but we have to find another way to do it. For instance, local platforms for flexibility, sending uh, local signals are emerging in Europe, virtual hubs, and, and these are very promising, I would say, research areas compared to the, uh, to the US approach, which would be harder to implement uh, in Europe. Very interesting. It's very, it's funny. Huh? I am, I am uh, coordinating the debate, but I'm interested by what you are saying. I, I would like to beat the audience to take notes, but I'm not in the audience, I'm there. Uh, the next question was also interesting. Ah, the next question, very interesting. Uh, guys, uh, and demand response. What role should demand response play in this new... Um, 
is this new system with a lot of renewable and and should demand response being used also in capacity markets or not and we can take the same uh, in the same order david chloe fabien and paul paul did i ask you your uh, answer regarding the zones no i forgot paul your answer regarding the zones zonal pricing oh. zonal pricing very live um, debate here in Australia right now, Jean-Michel, is, you know, we, we have a market that has five zones and, and we've got a bunch of policy, uh, market bodies that like to, to go to, zone, to nodal pricing, which for us would mean 1,400 uh, uh, nodes. And um, there is absolute unanimous, just unanimous uh, opposition from the market participants. Um, uh, they, and it, it really goes to, I guess, David, uh, and Chloe and Fabian's comment about the transaction costs. The, the, when you look at the literature on, on um, uh, you know, nodal pricing, as a general principle, all the studies will conclude, you, you, there's no question you'll get a more efficient dispatch result. And, and across that literature, somewhere between you know, 0.5 and 3.5% efficiency gains from doing so. Um, uh, I think in a market like Australia, we actually, our dispatch process already in, incorporates transmission constraints. And of course, all generators bid with their marginal loss factors. So those gains are probably a bit smaller here. I think all of us wish we started back in 1998 with nodal prices, but we are where we are. And we feel like changing from one to the other would be a little bit like drive, you know, switching from the left-hand side of the road driving to the right-hand side of the road driving. If you just think about the transaction costs of turning all those stop signs around and traffic lights and changing the car fleet over, everyone sort of goes to a state of despair and curls up in the fetal position and just hopes it goes away. So Paul is quite European vis-a-vis -vis nodal. Re regarding demand response, we will see. David, demand response? Well, I mean, we've always had demand response. Um, <clears throat> Um, procured originally by the system operator, um, and now the capacity mechanism does allow demand response. Uh, what seems to be clear is that demand response from industrial and commercial activities is really sensible. <clears throat> the cost of delivering it from households is prohibitive. Um, there's a lot of experiments on whether you can dispatch um, ground source heat pumps and air source heat pumps to get more response for the cost, but the cost of instrumenting the households seems to be pretty high. So yes, it's there. We would like to have more. We would like to get the cost of delivering it lower. Uh, you are telling the same like uh, Michael Pollitt a few days ago. Uh, not, not very surprising, uh, but interesting for me. Chloe. <laughs> Yeah, but I agree also. So, so if you think of a Nordic market, um, the demand response is rather weak. Um, so we could improve on, on this either. I mean, it wouldn't hurt, right? So we still, there is some cost also to implement and try to find the right angle. There is some behavioral component for sure. Why people do not react to prices? Is it because the gain is not so high? Um, uh, do they do not have the information? There's still a, a lot of question mark, but yeah, the most responsive part of the solution to have an efficient uh, system, definitely. It was quite funny because 10 years ago, the Nordics were mocking Continental U. You are not doing the one response. Uh, it works so well in the Nordic, etc. Uh, yes, uh, um, the tune changed. Fabien. Well, the fact is, I mean, if you look at Europe, there are still a number of markets where the non-response is either not allowed to participate in, in the market or not in all markets um, or, or being discriminated against, you know, simply because some, some of the product design has been, you know, uh, has been mirrored on, on what the supply side can provide. So I would say the first thing to do is obviously make sure uh, that the market design allows um, the non-response participation and, and also remove some, some of the implicit barriers to participation. As to where this is going to get us, I tend to agree, obviously, with, with David that, you know, industrial uh, customers, of course, um, you know, can do potentially a bit more. Um, residential ones, I mean, this is the next frontier. When, when we get there, we will have solved a lot of the issues we have today with market design. But the question is how to get there. And, and it's not that easy. 
Um, with the promise of technology, you know, digitalization coming in our homes, um, vehicle to grid. But, but the point is today that is quite expensive, A, and, and B, we also have some uh, acceptability issues. I mean, it's not just a, a question of the costs that need to go down. Is if you look at, at some of the early studies on, on you know, vehicle to grid, etc., uh, a number of customers simply uh, don't want this to, um, to, to happen, meaning giving control um, to the, the charging of their, of their vehicle. So, so I think we still have a number of challenges uh, ahead of us before we can deploy that massively. Okay, I will not give you my own view because I disagree with all of you. <laughs> Paul, what do you think about it? Look, I, the one thing I can say tell you about sort of demand response in the you know in, in Australia's national electricity market is it it uh, it turns up at the right time, uh, and I'm going to refer back to, or point back to that very large market price cap of ours again, fifteen thousand dollars a megawatt hour. A few months ago, it's May this year, we, we um, I don't want you all thinking that we have blackouts on a regular basis in Australia, because we truly don't, but we did have a bit, bit of an unusual one in, in, in the Queensland region. Um, it was a coal generator, a um, whole bunch of things went wrong with it, and uh, had a, a voltage collapse around the centre of, of Queensland, which, which led to sort of cascading coal-fired power station failures. And we ended up losing about 3,000 megawatts worth of kit and about 2,000 megawatts worth of load was, was shed. System was recovered within about four seconds and, and, and all good to go. Um, I was sitting, so I run the transmission network uh, utility in, in Queensland and I was talking to the market operator uh, at about two o'clock in the afternoon and they were quite convinced that we would have about 800 to 1,000 megawatts of, of load shedding that evening as, as load started rising. And I remember thinking at the time, scratching my head, it doesn't feel right. You know, surely the, the market will respond. And it did. In the end, we lost nothing. So no load whatsoever. And what it was, was a whole bunch of, um, you know, sort of resource industries, you know, hot water loads, you name it, retailers, customers, they all, you know, when they could see prices um, off, off the charts, they re responded. Now, it's a separate question as to whether they're prepared to do that every day because of intermittent sources. And I think the answer to that is no. But I think under the right conditions at the right time with the right sort of uh, money at stake, yep, demand has a funny way of, of, of uh, becoming quite active in, in the marketplace. Uh, I will migrate to Australia for a couple of months to, to study it better. I'm joking. Uh, I've been two times of Australia and there is a vibrant community regarding energy economics, electricity markets. I can only congratulate you on this. Uh, very, very interesting. Now we are going to close. The last question is not, not bad. Many other questions are asked, but this one is not bad. Uh, come on, guys. Carbon pricing. What role has or can have or will have carbon pricing in all of this? 30 seconds each. 30 seconds, David. Beep, beep. We introduced a carbon price floor. We moved out of coal massively and into renewables and gas. Um, the only thing is we were supposed to have a carbon price uh, support to keep it at a trajectory, uh, but we now add a carbon tax onto what is now an extraordinarily high EU ETS price. So um, once the treasurer gets his hands on a new tax, he hangs on to it. Merci, Adine. Uh, many thanks. Chloe. Yeah, carbon uh, pricing high is good. Um, let's see how this is combined with the green certificate uh, between Norway and Sweden and how you, you, you make sure that you have the right inv investment. Uh, yes, that's part of the solution, I would say. Très bien. I think one, one of the issues is, as David said, to have a predictable carbon price, not, not just one that is volatile. Another issue as we move to the next stage of decarbonization is that the marginal cost of abating carbon is no longer going to be driven by the power sector, but by other sectors, which potentially have a much higher abatement cost. And that raises questions in terms of affordability. If, of course, this is increasing power prices, uh, to a level which um, is, you know, the economy-wide socially efficient carbon cost, but but may re may raise some issues uh, in terms of affordability. We we are seeing that already today. You have some governments, for instance, the Spanish one, which has just passed an emergency tax um, to basically recover from low carbon generators 
some of the alleged windfall profits uh, due to the recent uh, spike in, in fuel and, and carbon prices. So this is the next generation of issues we are going to have to confront with rising carbon prices. I'm afraid. Paul, 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, I, noting Fabian's comments about, uh, um, uh, you know, volatility and so on, I guess in, in Australia we have had certificate prices for, you know, for green and, and different things over time, and they've been tremendously efficient uh, in terms of driving activity. We probably don't have anywhere near stiff enough signals in the marketplace, and in spite of that, we've managed to knock up quite a lot of renewable generation. I could only imagine what it would be like if we if we did have a stiff carbon price as well. It sure make life a lot easier to predict as to who was going to fall next. Many thanks to you, authors of the handbook. Many thanks to the audience. Excellent question. 20 other questions I'm unable to, to activate. And uh, I loved it. And I hope the audience too. This I will know later by, by seeing if the book is bought by anyone or by nobody. And I'm giving the floor back to Dave Williams. Dave, you have the floor. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Uh, wow, what an interesting set of, uh, uh, of uh, data, information, and professionalism on our first half of this. So I thank you very much. It's a great pleasure that I introduce the second phase of this webinar series, Electricity Markets Assessment in the US. Uh, we have moderator Catherine Wolfram with us today. Catherine is currently the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate and energy economics at U.S. Treasury. Uh, she's uh, on leave right now, also from the faculty of uh, UC Berkeley to uh, perform this important uh, job in the U.S. Catherine, we're, we're, we're pleased to have you with us. Please, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, David, and, and thank you all. This looks like a tremendous book, and I, I look forward to digging into it. Um, the, the chapters that are part of this panel, as, as well as chapters that, that were just discussed in the previous panel. Um, so we have a, a tremendous set of uh, presenters today, and, and I want to let them get to it so that, that we can have time to ask questions. We'll go in the order of the, the chapters in the book. So we'll start with um, Professor Dick Schmalenzi, who will talk to us about strengths and weaknesses of, of traditional arrangements for electricity supply. And just to, to quickly say that um, in the last seven months at the Biden administration, the electricity sector has, has if anything, grown in importance. Just the amount of, of electrification that's anticipated in many sectors, buildings, industry, transport, um, and, and pair that with the supply side changes that, that are envisioned um, to achieve, for instance, the, the president's goal of 80% clean supply by, by 2030. So putting those two, two trends together is going to be an enormous lift. And so having an, a kind of firm grasp of what's happened over the past 20 or 30 years is, is going to be essential. So I, I look forward to having this discussion with, with this group of, of authors. Um, Dick, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Catherine. Um, let me get to the screen here. So um, this is roughly the title of my chapter in the handbook. And I have to say, Paul Jaskow persuaded me to write it, and I agreed before I thought what an impossible assignment this is. Uh, even if you look within the US, traditional arrangements varied enormously. There's a huge federal role in some places, no federal role, cooperatives, municipals. And strengths and weaknesses of what traditional arrangements relative to what alternatives. And it seemed to me one wants to have real alternatives. So, I took rather a broad brush approach in this chapter. The one thing that restructuring after the 90s did was to uh, dramatically increase the role of competitive markets, particularly at the wholesale level. And the US has had, we, we didn't restructure nationally. We did in some areas in different ways. And we have traditional arrangements uh, bubbling along in other parts. So a comparison within the US holds a lot of things constant, legal system and so forth. So my main focus in the chapter, not exclusively, was to look at cross-section performance differences associated with restructuring 
mainly in the US. Uh, consistent with the handbooks organization, uh, it seemed to me important to distinguish two different regimes. The historical regime that was in the 90s when restructuring happened, where it happened, uh, thermal generation dominated, uh, a lot of variable cost, uh, a, as in the previous discussion. There was a lot of experience on which uh, uh, restructuring could draw, and there's a lot of data uh, and experience that can be used for evaluation. There's an emerging regime, that again, in different parts of the country, in which variable uh, generation, variable renewable generation will come to dominate, mainly wind and solar. And we don't actually know what a wind solar dominated system looks like. Um, so to talk about strengths and weaknesses in the emerging regime, uh, my chapter spends a little bit of time comparing California and Hawaii. They're both committed to carbon free electricity by 2045. Uh, California has a wholesale market, Hawaii doesn't. So in the historical regime, one thing that must be noted, and David Newberry's discussion makes it clear, I, when Paul Joskow and I wrote Markets for Power, we sort of had the view that I think a lot of people had, which is, you know, we know these technologies, this is not rocket science, we've been generating electricity for a long time, and we've had tight power pools that look like com competition. So it shouldn't be that hard to make wholesale markets work. Well, it was. Uh, overall, if you look at generation operations, given the set of assets rather, it seems clear, a lot of evidence that restructuring competition reduced costs, nodal pricing further increased efficiency, but market power likely increased price cost gaps, varying from place to place and time to time. In capacity investment, competition for the market. Um, initially, uh, the belief seems to have been as in automobiles that you don't need a market for capacity in, a in addition to the market for the final product. Sales revenues would provide investment incentives. But you impose price caps and you set very high reliability standards. And at some point you say, well, we're not actually getting the investment we need. And, and in the US, even in uh, regimes that are dominated, uh, areas that are dominated by fossil fuels, uh, capacity is largely administratively determined. What's the reserve margin? What do we need? What's, what, what's the target in a capacity market? We have, as uh, Fabienne said, hybrid systems in the US where there's competition in operations and a lot of administration in uh, investment. What about prices to final customers? Well, I don't think restructuring has made much difference. Large U.S. customers can get at least time can get at least time of use pricing in some areas, maybe something like real time, and you can argue that demand response designed to deal with shortages uh, um, has a dimension of, of real time pricing. But basically, uh, retail comp re restructuring, whether or not it led to retail competition hasn't led to much more efficient pricing in the US. And I will say retail competition hasn't worked that well, at least in the US in most cases. What about the emerging regime? Well, to be clear, these are new problems. Um, how do you run a system when everybody has, low, has zero marginal cost, all the generators have zero marginal cost and their output depends on the weather? Uh, we've never done one of those. So the traditional systems and their regulators, and Hawaii is my example, I, I have a son and family there, they and their regulators grope project by project. In California, the trick is, and the hard trick, is to modify uh, market designs, which came out of the historical regime where variable costs matter. Uh, you gotta modify those designs to attempt uh, to induce efficient outcomes. So if you look at operations, a novel and important uh, element that certainly wasn't on the screen when these markets were designed uh, is storage. Market, organized markets are groping toward developing rules for storage and how can it, how can it uh, uh, participate. California is issuing mandates for uh, quantities of storage. You look at Hawaii, they are building storage, but it's a project by project debate between the utility 
and the regulator. They're not doing general rules. In terms of investment, uh, you think about capacity markets, which we are almost certainly going to need uh, in the new regime. The existing capacity markets or capacity mechanisms, depending on where they are, were not designed to handle renewables and storage, and they need to be modified. Hawaii doesn't have capacity markets. They have project by project arguments. California is imposing mandates. We need so much flexible capacity. We need so much storage. Uh, this is, this is uh, uh, administratively determined investment. In retail pricing, one feature of uh, markets uh, or systems in the new regimes is that wholesale spot prices or marginal costs are going to be more variable. So real-time pricing will be more valuable. And I actually put, a, put emphasis on low prices. If you want economy-wide decarbonization, you want people to be able to see and take advantage of periods of low prices. Well, California and Hawaii don't have retail competition. Neither regulator is moving rapidly at the retail level. So my fear is we will have very variable wholesale prices and most people will see constant retail prices. So in the, historic, in the historical regime, uh, there are pluses in my, uh, sorry, in restructuring, there are pluses and minuses, but it's hard to see, just looking at the US experience, a large gap overall, particularly on retail pricing. In the emerging regime, traditional systems may have more flexibility. Uh, Hawaii, they do good old in integrated resource planning. They're not trying to design general rules. But of course, new challenges may increase utilities' information advantages, may slow regulatory proceedings. And while traditional systems arguably have an advantage in the transition to a decarbonized system, those advantages will likely be temporary. Uh, final note, the US will have both traditional and restructured systems uh, uh, as, as far as the eye can see. So we'll be able to see how strengths and weaknesses evolve as the transition continues. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dick. And as moderator, I'm especially thankful to you for staying to our agreed uh, 10 minute per, per presenter. So next, Frank Wallach, Professor Frank Wallach is going to dig in on, on wholesale electricity market design. Um, Frank, take it away. Thanks very much. Let me just share my screen. Sorry, trying to get there. This can you is my full screen? Hello? I don't, don't think so. Don't, yeah, yeah, not yet. Not oh. yet. Oh. How about it? it uh, huh. Nothing? Nope, just you. Uh oh. <laughs> you like to click share sometimes. Yeah, I did. Huh. Yeah. There. there you go. Yeah, perfect. Right. Just a minute. Okay, so now how about now? Got it. Great. Okay, thanks very much. Sorry about that for my technical ineptitude. Given how much I've been zooming, I should know better. All right. So today, what I was like to talk about is just some what I call the lessons that we've learned from the U.S. experience with restructuring. Uh, we we have many different markets in the United States, uh, uh, um, and I did, would like to just go through the overarching theme of my presentation is is going to be that look restructuring I think can yield economic benefits if you if efficient prices are set and customers are allowed to be exposed to these prices. If you don't want to do that, restructuring is unlikely to be uh, anything better than at least what we had in the United States. So the first issue is this, what we call match between the network model uh, used to operate the market and the network model used to operate the grid. And this was a big lesson that we learned in the United States because these markets in New England, California, and even PJM all started as zonal markets. And pretty quickly, we found that effectively this difference between the net, these two models uh, gave generation units owners the opportunity to play at least what was called in California and Texas and other markets, the so-called debt game, where you sell uh, energy that you know is physically infeasible 
and essentially buy it back at a lower price and get paid for effectively not supplying any electricity or the ink game where you essentially bid high because you know you're needed uh, in, the, uh, in real time. And in that sense, you get paid that higher offer price uh, uh, rather than being paid the day ahead price. And the simple argument that I like to always say is in real time, physics always wins. And the reality of the grid is how the grid's operated must be respected. Market participants are gonna use that. We, uh, in a paper, talk about uh, what's happened in the Italian market where this ink deck game uh, certainly seems to be relevant. It's also relevant in uh, the, the, the German market, all, virtually all the zonal markets around the world. So the US solution was to adopt LMP. And uh, essentially, what this does is does not allow you to have infeasible schedules accepted in the day ahead market. Uh, because why? Because what you're doing is you're running the market that you think is going to happen in real time. And moreover, you're optimizing it with respect to all 24 hours of the day at once and likely getting an accounting for startups and uh, minimum loads and other costs so you can get a more efficient schedule uh, in the day ahead market that is a financially binding schedule. And then in real time, you're gonna do what you always do in every electricity supply industry. You're going to respect the operating constraints on the generation units, operating constraints on the transmission network to operate the system in real time. It's just, you're gonna now take the prices that result from that and clear the imbalances. So the, uh, the other issue is this, what called multi-settlement as was discussed uh, earlier today, many markets around the world only have a single settlement. Um, a a multi-settlement market essentially allows you to take advantage and, and essentially get a more efficient dispatch in a world in which you have these, in the language of economics, non-convexities, meaning a startup cost, a minimum load cost. And what you do is you essentially optimize that for all 24 hours of the day at once and decide whether to turn a unit on or turn a unit off to, to minimize that and getting the day ahead schedule. Uh, and the big issue just to emphasize is, is that if you're running a multi-settlement zonal market, that is essentially the recipe for the ink deck game. So it's very important that you run both the day ahead and real-time markets and any intraday markets as an LMP market. And in terms of the benefits of LMP, I think there's pretty strong evidence that they're quite significant. I mean, uh, given uh, we did uh, look in California, effectively for to achieve the same dispatch of the thermal generation units in California, um, uh, a quantity of energy. Uh, what we found was essentially roughly about a hundred million dollar uh, reduction in that cost annually uh, to essentially achieve the same amount of thermal generation annually that you got under the former zonal multi-settlement zonal market design uh, simply because you get this more efficient dispatch. And in Texas, uh, the uh, benefits are actually even greater. Uh, what we found was roughly about a $300 million uh, cost reduction. You're gonna pay for any cost of transition uh, in the first, uh, first year of operation. Um, the other is, is that um, active demand side participation in a multi-settlement market is, uh, uh, is very uh, easy, largely because what you're doing is you're buying a product that you then can subsequently sell. And that is the way that you can get, um, whereas you don't have to worry about this problem that happens in traditional demand response products in a single settlement market where you have to answer the question of what would the consumer have consumed had you not asked that consumer uh, to reduce their demand. In a multi-settlement market, they just buy what they would like to consume. And if they don't consume it, they're effectively selling it in the in the real-time market. And for a, a more detailed discussion of that, I'll give a plug to a recent uh, book uh, finished on the future of electricity retailing that talks about those sorts of issues. Now, the final next thing that we learned and I think from the US is the importance of a local market power mitigation mechanism. And here, what you have is essentially as part of the market software, it essentially determines three things. System conditions when a given supplier is worthy of mitigation, the offer of the supplier is mitigated to some reference level, that reference never needs to be determined. And then how do you pay the mitigated and unmitigated suppliers? There's a variety of approaches that are used in the United States. I think these are, this is something that if any market 
has effectively uh, a, a implicit market power mitigation mechanism. The difference is in the US is that we, these are explicitly part of the market design. Uh, this paper gives a sort of survey of these things with recommendations for uh, different market designs, but uh, it would seem to me unadvisable in any electricity supply industry to move forward with restructuring without a local market power mitigation mechanism in place. The final point I'd like to talk about is co-optimization of energy and ancillary services. So here, what you're doing when you're operating that day ahead or that real-time market is you're saying, give me all your bids for energy and ancillary services. And what I will do as the system operator is minimize the as offered cost to meeting the demand for energy and operating reserves in all markets uh, in all 24 hours a day and all markets simultaneously. What this does is essentially ensure that you get what's called, you don't use a stale price for pricing the ancillary services. So the example I give is a supplier with a one megawatt offer price could be taken for 10 megawatts of operating reserves at $5 because of essentially a belief that the uh, day ahead price was, was $23 um, and his marginal cost was 20, but in real time he could regret that. And so these sequential markets are always going to be using a stale price, a price from a previous market or an expected future market, but in a co-optimized market, you're gonna get exactly the right opportunity cost because you are solving that optimization problem to find the most uh, uh, efficient place to use that offer. So for example, the advantage of, a, uh, just to give you an example, in the first three years of California's market with, we had a sequential market, these were the percentages that the ancillary services cost was of annual energy cost. In the last three years in California, where we had almost 30% renewables, where you'd expect a significant increase in ancillary services cost, you can see the percentages here are massively lower. The other thing about this co-optimization is that it, it, it provides an incentive for the supplier to do what the system operator would like them to do because of the fact that it puts them providing the service that gives them the largest margin. And so if you win for energy, you want to supply the energy given the price that we're out there for ancillary services. So the last two issues, just to briefly sort of go to other areas, is this long-term resource adequacy mechanism. The big point I'd make is that I think that every market with a finite offer cap requires such a mechanism. Uh, it need not be a capacity. I am a firm believer in there are better approaches than that. And then the other thing that I think has been very important in the US markets is the role of independent market monitoring and oversight and a, a detailed discussion of that is contained in the uh, paper that I cited there. So thank you. Wow, thanks, Frank. Um, yeah, and thank you for sticking to the 10 minutes. I, I know that my kids, uh, while they were doing Zoom classes, would sometimes listen to their lectures at one and a half speed. And I take it that your students did not do the same thing because <laughs> listening to Frank at normal speed is, is, is fast enough. Um, great. So last but not least, we have Professor Shmuel Oren talking to us about uh, ERCOT, successes so far uh, and lessons learned. Shmuel. Okay, let me try to get my... Okay. Um, so first I want to acknowledge my co-authors, um, Ross Baldig from University of Texas at Austin, uh, Eric Schubert was a former member of the Market Oversight Division at the Public Utility Commission of Texas, and former Commissioner uh, Ken Anderson. Uh, this is uh, just to illustrate that uh, ERCOT is uh, essentially an electric island, a single state, that, um, and uh, therefore not subject to FERC jurisdiction. Um, it um, serves uh, 26 million people, which is about 75% of the Texas population. And uh, the capacity is uh, about 75 uh, gigawatt, which is quite significant. Uh, as you can see, the generation mix, we, it's about 25% wind now, 50% natural gas, and the rest is uh, quite low. Uh, 
so let's first dispose of the big elephant in the room. In mid-February, Texas endured the one in 30 years cold weather event where large swat of electricity customers uh, were without power for 48 or 96 hours. And uh, the Texas legislator uh, subsequently passed legislation ordering the PUCT to make certain changes to the market. And this was all after we wrote our chapter, so we, won't, we are not going to discuss that. Uh, so the, the main feature of the Texas market basically covers a lot of the things that Frank talked about. But uh, one important thing that has driven the market design in Texas is retail choice. And this is a prominent thing there um, that is not shared by um, other states. Uh, state policy facilitated technological innovation by encouraging renewables and uh, through the um, a competitive region uh, renewable energy zones uh, where the transmission to those areas was, was socialized and the, the ma mandating of smart meters, which now 98% of the Texas uh, retailers, retail market has. Um, other feature, Texas nodal market, it's a nodal market. And the one uh, important thing that characterizes Texas is that it's energy only market with uh, where generator have no obligation to serve and uh, there are scarcity prices through operating reserve demand curve, ORDC, that was recently introduced, and we'll talk about that later. But the idea is that um, recognizing that the system operator is in the business of mitigating outages, so it mutes scarcity signals. So one way to uh, bring the scarcity signal back into the market, which is necessary in energy-only market, is to look at their operating reserves. And as you deplete the operating reserve to introduce a price um, by, by having a, a demand function for reserve, which was designed by, by Bill Hogan. Uh, then uh, the market monitoring and market power mitigation as Frank described. And in addition, there are circuit breakers on, uh, on the price, which uh, basically tries to, uh, if you start to have scarcity prices and they last too long, at some point you are going to curtail them. Um, and there are some criteria for doing that. Um, the governance is there is a three tier, you know, there is the Texas legislature, the PUC that gives order to the PUCT, and then uh, a PUCT regulates the air cot and uh, which interacts with the market. Um, so um, the, the implementation, one important thing is how the retail uh, choice was implemented. Uh, the idea was from the beginning that they want mass market customers uh, should be encouraged to shop for independent energy providers. And uh, that was created and encouraged by uh, having something called the price to beat, which froze the prices for the incumbent utility to pre-restructuring and index them to the gas prices. A 20% limit on generation capacity share to mitigate market power. That was another uh, uh, thing that was introduced right from the beginning. Mass deployment of smart meters. And there is a strong political mandate for retail competition and the consistent uh, PUCT policy to remove import constraint and uh, um, create uh, access uh, a transmission network that uh, makes it easy to access some of the resources in the South and the West. Uh, the Texas legislature also uh, made some important decisions, increasing the renewable portfolio standard, uh, transmission expansion, um, uh, with the uh, socialized cost under the CRES policy, which I just described, and the uh, mass installation of smart meters. So the evolution, the market design evolution, initially the design ignored technical constraints and uh, uh, the pervasive gaming under the deck game, especially Enron was taking advantage of that, um, uh, led to the zonal market and then eventually to a nodal market. Um, energy only market was strongly supported by the renewable port uh, 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 retail energy providers who view the role 
as providing hedges to retail customers, and therefore they view a capacity market as competing with that, uh, with their business. A system operator uh, use of operating reserve to avoid the shortages is, as I described, mute scarcity signal, and eventually that led to the introduction of the operating reserve demand curve to provide scarcity prices. So the, um, the prices for energy are capped now at $9,000 a megawatt hour. And on top of that, you can have a price for reserve that is another 9,000. So during the shortage in February, we've seen prices as high as $17,000 a megawatt hour, um, which some of the people were exposed to. A bid base and there is a, they start, we started with the bid base central unit commitment but uh, in order to be centrally dispatched, uh, the cost has to be verified and that uh, eventually created incentive for people to self uh, dispatch, which is now the prevailing uh, mode. Most generators are self dispatching and don't submit their bids to central unit commitment. Uh, again, initial design address market power by just limiting the share or to, uh, of uh, market share to 20%. And they, they have the term that fish, small fish swim free. Uh, sooner or eventually they discover that small fish in the, in the ocean can be a big fish in the lagoon. And they, so uh, they had to move to a more uh, aggressive, more proactive market power mitigation. So now it's being used, uh, there are structural uh, mitigation with the uh, default energy bids when the screen uh, when the generators, you know, the condition don't pass the screen. Um, so um, the meeting the challenges, you know, the, uh, basically the, the, the whole approach is to have a very active uh, governance uh, that uh, meets challenges. In the book, we describe how the Texas market have met those challenges like changes in ERCOT nodal protocols to facilitate wind integration that now uh, is, um, is quite high, uh, the introduction of the operating reserve demand curve, uh, market performance and tight reserve margins in summer 2019, and integrating uh, distributed energy resources. All those were challenges that were met through a very active uh, participation of uh, the stakeholders and the, the governing boards. So uh, the recipe for success, a supportive political and economic climate, the Texas geography, which is basically it's a single state system. So decisions are much simpler, a booming local economy, a, the style of governance a, that was adopted prominent role of business community and stakeholder in influencing the market debate, uh, independence from FERC, that's an important aspect, and the uh, clear and consistent policy directives. Thank you. Great, thank you, Shmuel. Uh, so I will direct some questions to the, the panelists myself, but feel free as the audience to type your questions into the, the Q&A and we can draw on those as well. Um, so I'll, I'll start at the top with, with Dick. You described the traditional and the restructured markets. Um, I, I would like you to talk a bit about kind of interactions between those markets. So for instance, with, with transmission planning, you know, what, what happens when we're, we're dealing with both types of markets. Um, and as we move into more and more heavily renewables based systems, presumably interstate transmission is gonna be more of, a, of an issue. So uh, if you could just tell us a bit about that issue, talk a bit about transmission. Well, transmission remains regulated, of course, uh, and with the guaranteed return, the problem is planning and siting. Uh, boundary crossing raises difficulties. Uh, in New England, we've been trying to get uh, transmission to deliver hydropower from Quebec into New England, which involves an international border, which is the least of the problems, but a couple of state borders and a national uh, forest. And it can't be cited. Uh, <laughs> you simply cannot get political agreement. So I, I think any 
any boundary crossing between utilities, even with the same regulatory regime, is complicated. Crossing ISO RTO boundaries is complicated. Crossing states, states play a major role. And I think it's less a problem uh, with different regulatory regimes than simply different states. I, I remember years ago, uh, a transmission line uh, was proposed from someplace in Arizona to California and a state legislator in Arizona said, that is a straw to suck our cheap power out to California and it's never gonna happen. And it didn't happen. So I think that building the kind of transmission we're gonna need for efficient large scale integration of renewables is gonna be a major problem in the current policy regime. That's a downer. <laughs> Frank, you had your hand up, did you wanna? To... Chime in on transmission. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it, it, that, that line was the Palo Verde Devers two line, and uh, essentially it was declared a strategic transmission corridor. And as Dick said, it it never went anywhere for precisely the reason that Dick said. But I guess the the point that I, I wanted to emphasize was is the that we need to think about transmission planning kind of like politics in the sense that we know that every transmission line makes somebody happy and somebody else sad. And so what we need to do is package these things together in uh, sort of log rolling kinds of bundles and say, vote for the bundle or don't vote for the bundle. So in that sense, we give something to hopefully everyone, which gives us that sort of, we hope, Pareto improving move. That's the one thing that I think would be you know, extremely beneficial is, 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 is if there was more of a regional or even national transmission planning process to put these things up to, for, to the states for, for approval. That's about the only chance we have given that there's no, you know, citing authority uh, for FERC to, to, to make transmission lines go like they can with natural gas. Right. I, yes, and I also think that uh, a, big, a big problem is uh, in addition to the uh, where you build the transmission, the rule you know under uh, FERC order 2000 the, 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 or 1000, the, the way the cost allocation mechanism uh, of uh, beneficiary pays have not really uh, been very easy to implement. I think that that's one of the advantages yeah. that the airport market has uh, of basically saying just we know that that's where the wind is going to be let's build lines and socialize the cost and uh, treat essentially transmission as an inter in, as a public good in, within the state and not worry about uh, who pays for it and that that made it very easy to do now, now obviously when you start to deal with multi-states that makes it a little more difficult to do but that, the, the cost allocation for transmission is a big problem yeah, so I know that, that FERC is undertaking reform of the cost allocation rules and the uh, infrastructure bill includes a DOE based grid authority. So, you know, maybe maybe that type of bundling is, is something that that's envisioned. Um, so Frank, a question directed to you. You, you described the benefits of the multi-settlement process partly as um, aiding with with kind of planning um, for fossil units that face startup costs. So do the same benefits carry over with, with variable um, renewables? And, and it, how, how do you see multi-settlement markets evolving with a market that's got more and more renewables? Oh, I, I actually think the benefits are even greater when you have a larger share of renewables for the simple reason that you have to incorporate more contingencies into your day ahead uh, planning process so that uh, just in case uh, things disappear in terms of renewables, you have the necessary reserves. And uh, empirically, I think that's been the case uh, simply because if you take the case of California, California has implemented a number of new uh, ancillary services, in particular, uh, the one I could describe is called fast ramp product, where essentially it holds out uh, output from uh, dispatchable thermal resources that have variable uh, off price offers that are below the market clearing price, but are needed to essentially meet the late evening ramp 
when all the solar disappears. So they're compensated for the fact that they're not supplying energy in the middle of the day, but they are going to be there to get that, 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 that fast ramp. And, the, and so they can be built, that can be built into the day ahead market and ensure that we'll have adequate uh, ramp capacity available to meet that ramp at the end of the day. So I think that it, the benefits of going to a multi-settlement LMP market are even greater as you get a larger share of intermittent renewables on the system. In fact, some people have argued there should be more than two markets, more than a spot and a day ahead. There should be intraday markets because weather forecasts get better as you get closer. Yep, definitely. Yeah, I, in, in a way, you know, the, the two settlement system can be viewed as a market solution to a stochastic optimization, to, you know, multi, multi-stage stochastic optimization because essentially the market solves the stochastic optimization problem by having... Um, you know, the initial uh, decisions and then when as uncertainty is being revealed that uh, you have the adjustments. So uh, that's definitely uh, as, as we have more and more uncertainty because of the renewables, this becomes more important. And I definitely agree with uh, what uh, Dick just said that uh, we probably should move to a intraday market because uh, that will address a lot of the non-convexity issues that now people are debating with that will give people more than one one opportunity to uh, more, more opportunity to adjust their position i want also to add that an important aspect of the multi-settlement is to have virtual bidding and both uh, frank and i uh, have shown in some of our research how uh, the virtual bidding is essentially closes the gap uh, and uh, br br brings the prices in, in tune because then we are having all these virtual bidder par bidders participating and increasing the liquidity in the market. So the, the, this is an important component of uh, having a multi-settlement to have arbitrage opportunity between the different settlement that brings more information to the market. Just to follow on, if it's okay with the, what Shmuel said on the virtuals, the other thing that we find in the in this research is that particularly during periods where the so-called non-convexity, so a simple example would illustrate is that you have many units in, in California, declining number fortunately, that are long start units. So that if they aren't essentially scheduled in the day ahead market, they are going to get uh, unable to operate in real time. And so what the uh, virtual uh, bidders can do is in the day ahead market, they can go to the various locations, any location in the grid, submit a virtual demand bid to effectively get that unit dispatched in the day ahead market. And if it turns out that that is uh, essentially a lower cost solution, they can oftentimes profit from the fact that they, by trading that day ahead real time price difference, they get a more efficient dispatch in the day ahead market that essentially reduces the cost of serving demand in real time. And in fact, what we find in, in, the, in this research is that that is actually true uh, during the periods in which the complexity of operating the grid in real time as measured by the uh, variation spatially in the nodal prices is greatest. So while we're, while we're on nodal pricing, there's one question in the, the Q&A um, directed to Frank, but, but uh, Shmuel and, and Dick, you're happy to, I'd be happy to have you chime in as well. Um, that asks why why we think Europe and Australia have not gone for nodal pricing. Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, I the the one question that I have is is that I mean it, to me the cost of going to nodal pricing is it's the not going to nodal pricing. The cost of the 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 important thing I think is important to bear in mind is that every system operator in the world essentially operates their, their market or their, their industry, uh, respecting the operating constraints, the transmission constraints on the system, all these kinds of things in real time. They just don't set the prices that are associated with operating the system in that manner in real time. 
all you're doing with nodal pricing is you're just saying, not only am I going to set those prices in real time at each location in the transmission network, but when I schedule the units in a day ahead market, I am going to operate the, uh, uh, recognize that I'm also operating the transmission network and the generation units to respect those constraints. That That's all you're doing. So to me, I, I, I just don't see any significant increase in cost of transitioning to the nodal market design. It's it's all, 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 all benefits to me. Uh, and if you're worried about equity issues in terms of differences in prices to loads, like for example, in the case of California, the folks in San Francisco paying more than the folks in the Central Valley, you can just do what we do and is done in many nodal markets, which is you charge a quantity weighted average of the nodal prices to all loads, but you make sure all generators uh, face the nodal price at their location. So uh, it just, it, it's, it's a puzzle it, 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 to me, I have to confess. <laughs> I, I, asked that, I posed that question to a, a European at one point, and the answer I got was, our regulators aren't smart enough. Now, I, I don't think that's right. Uh, I, I doubt there's a big IQ difference across the Atlantic. Yeah, I, you know, the, the, this issue of how, how realistic or how much the market, the, the commercial model should adhere to the physical constraint uh, has been something that we debated from the early days of market design. And I think that fortunately in the United States, we concluded that physics wins. Um, I think that, um, you know, I mean, in Texas, I, at the time I was trying to convince uh, Pat Wood about that and he learned the hard way uh, how the deck game is being played. Uh, you know, we had like in two days, there was like $18 million of transactions trying playing the deck game. Uh, I actually have a license plate on my car called the deck game, which became famous. <laughs> and <laughs> so um, I, my, my only under, uh, answer to why they don't do it in Australia, I think that the Australians probably are too lazy to play games and they don't take advantage of the opportunity <laughs> that is available to them. I once uh, participated in a workshop in, 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 the, in, Norway, in Norway and was pointing out the kind of game that can be played across the Norway, between the Norway and Sweden. And they looked at me and said, we don't think like that in Scandinavia. So I think it's a matter of uh, to what extent, uh, you know, how many MBAs you have that are going to take advantage of gaming opportunities. Yeah, so we'll have to have the, the previous panel back at some point to give their perspectives. That, um, well, one they're... thing too, Ed, Catherine, I would say is I, I do know, I participated in a few of the discussions in Europe of transitioning to LMP and the one group that loves the existing market to design consistent with Shmuel's comment is the energy traders. So I yeah. think they understand where their, their bread is buttered. Interesting. Um, why, don't, why don't we go down the retail hole for, for a little while? So Shmuel, um, Dick described how he thought that, that retail in general hadn't been a success. Do you think um, Texas is, is a, a counter example to that? generalization and and if so you know what what's made what's made for some success in texas well you know i mean it's a matter of philosophy i mean the whole texas deregulation started with the notion that they want even the smallest customer to be able to benefit from competition so retail choice has been driving this whole deregulation and they make it as easy as possible you know like in california uh, when we were trying to, uh, to do a, a retail competition, PG&E was making it difficult to transfer records and to get the information. In Texas, from the beginning, they make the switching easy. And uh, as a result of that, like 60% of customer of the load is uh, benefiting from retail choice and um, essentially get their energy through uh, the retail uh, energy providers. So that has uh, been very effective in facilitating some of the penetration of technology. Now we have all this edge technology behind the meters and all this uh, 
new thing that facilitate customer participation and demand response. And, you know, we still uh, have a way to go in terms of uh, making demand response more, uh, you know, advancing demand response in, uh, in Texas, but uh, it's definitely ahead of the curve in there compared to other places. So, you know, I, I think that uh, the retail competition has been a, a very successful there. Two, two comments. Uh, first, I think it, one key to success in Texas is that everybody had to make a choice. There was no default tariff. You couldn't do nothing. Uh, in Massachusetts, we have retail competition, and a number of studies have found that people who choose competitive suppliers often pay more than they would pay under the default tariff. Uh, costs of searching are high, a dollar amounts involved are low. Um, and so it just, this friction seem to be in most retail markets uh, important. Um, the other thing I would say is what you'd like, you know, all retail suppliers are buying a commodity in the same market, uh, maybe different terms. So you wouldn't expect dramatic uh, cost differences simply because it has to do with how clever you are with hedging and so forth. So it's never seemed to me that you're gonna get uh, big cuts in cost delivered to consumers. What you might hope for, particularly with a lot of smart meters, is you might hope for retail prices that are more responsive to wholesale market conditions. And of course, we have the one example in Texas of Gritty, which did that, and we all applauded, and then it's Until customers February. paid the wholesale price, yeah, and got crushed, and Gritty is no more. So getting retail prices that actually give customers incentives to cha to to respond uh, to demand. I, I, somebody in the previous panel said, you know, or so on this panel, that demand responses we normally think of it is incentives to shut down when the system is under stress. In in all more other markets, demand responses: you buy more when the price is low, you buy less when the price is high. There are no special deals. Electricity ought to be like that with automated response. We're moving so slowly. And I think retail competition where it has existed, even in Texas, ha has not moved us down that road. So we're gonna have wildly varying wholesale prices and constant retail prices, not a good plan. I, I, wanna, I wanna push back a little because I, I think that, I, I, while I agree with the experience of Gritty, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a, that's, if you like, a, a, an argument for regulatory oversight of the uh, retailing industry. Uh, and, and I'll give a plug to, to the, the book that I was talking about. But the basic idea is that there's the standard problem of buy on the spot market is a great idea 99.99% .99 of the time until it's not when the price spikes as it did in Texas. And so the gritty model. So it's the same thing as the I'd argue the retail, uh, the sort of uh, SNL crisis in the sense of speculating on the ratepayers' dime is a great idea. So you need to worry about that problem. But the other thing that I wanted to comment on is an important reason why everybody goes to the default price, and it's because the default price has essentially a um, is backed by the full faith and credit of the regulator. In other words, the, what the regulator does is sets this default retail price that allows you to buy as much as you want at that fixed retail price. And the thing that made Texas work very well is the so-called price to be, which was set based on like a seven, six to $7 price of gas. And then what happened when the price of gas fell as a result of the shale gas boom down to about $3, they did not reset the price to be. So that gave the retail margin, uh, which contained the risk premium for those customers on that fixed default rate, gave the headroom necessary for retail competition to happen. What happens, I'm sure, in New England, and I know happens in California, is the California regulator goes, all right, we're going to take the average wholesale price, we think, for the year, and we're going to put on the transmission distribution price, and that's the fixed default price. There's no value proposition for retailers uh, because right. basically the, the, the government is managing the risk for you. So there needs to be some cheese in order for the, you know, the mice to, 
to run the maze, so to speak. And, and it, it is that price to beat in Texas and the decision of the Texas PUC not to uh, knock it down when the gas prices fell. And that's the hard part to get across to regulators is that you, you've got to leave that little margin in there if you want retail competition to come. Yeah, the, 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 the other thing, you know, at the beginning of the, the retail competition in Texas, I mean, the technology of the, the demand side technology was not as developed behind the meter. So most of the role, the main role of the retailers was to give customers a choice between a, essentially fixed rates versus rates that will follow the wholesale price. And they, the, the, most of the option, the products that were offered were different mixes. It's like giving people in the, reg in the mortgage industry the choice between fixed mortgage rates and variable mortgage rates. And uh, usually over the last 20 years, if you choose a variable mortgage rate, you probably came out ahead. And uh, so uh, every once in a while, there is a, you know, the, the thing with greedy, it's a matter of whether cost, you know, and there's the big debate now, whether the mom and pop uh, customers have the understanding of risk to manage um, the, the, you know, to follow the spot price or the, and of the market. And um, I, you know, I, I, I was sad to see greedy being kicked out. It's a matter of education. And in fact, they offered people, they told them the price is going to go up, you better switch. And people do, didn't do that. So if somebody chooses to keep his lights on at uh, seventeen thousand dollars a megawatt hour and they follow the spot price, you cannot imagine who would do that unless you have a, a you know a pot farm and you're trying to keep the lights on for it. <laughs> but uh, um, that was I you know it's a matter of uh, educating the customer and to what extent people should be allowed to gamble. I also think one of the things that can change, and I hope will change the, the retail market, is uh, contracts that involve sort of central control over demand, right? Uh, I, maybe I want gritty prices, but I would like gritty to just shut off every appliance I have when the, when the price goes high. Uh, and that's certainly feasible. You've got smart meters. Um, appliances are built with the ability to do that now. I keep waiting for that technology to take over uh, and for those contracts to get written in areas with retail competition, and maybe they will be. And I think Frank's right. You do need a little regulatory oversight. Well, I can, I can tell you I have smart plugs throughout my house, all controllable from my cell phone, and each of them cost me about five bucks. So I can, I can, I can turn off everything. So the good news is when I go out of town, I can, I can make my lights go on, my lights go off so people don't know I'm gone. You might well, not be I, a typical customer, Frank. No, that's for sure. I'm definitely, uh, uh, be, uh, Catherine's smiling, so I know she probably has the same sorts of things at her house. We're electricity geeks. No, I'm, no, I'm but, willing to delegate my, my uh, control to Frank. I think. Yeah, you can watch yeah but I think that this brings the question of whether at the retail level, um, electricity, and some people may disagree with me, whether when at the, at the, down at the retail level, whether electricity should be treated as a commodity and uh, sold on a spot price, or it should be treated more of a service where you choose make your choices in advance the same way as you choose your deductible on the insurance policy, or you choose your, the class of ticket when you're flying in an airplane that you essentially commit to a quality of service in advance where you have, you know, where people have a, a good intuition about that. And then you rely on the provider to, to enforce that quality of service. And that's what uh, Dick was saying that, you know, you, you buy a contract from Greedy and you can buy a priority of service or something like that. And you say, I want that quality, you know, buy quality differentiated service with a, with a price that you know in advance and you rely on them to actually enforce it through the edge technologies that we currently have available. Well, I think that's right. And I think in a, in a system where most costs are fixed, uh, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have per kilowatt hour charges determining your electricity bill. 
we have to move toward more fixed charges somehow. Well, I'll make a plug to chapter seven in the book that it tells you exactly what you're talking about, Shmuel, where it basically says, I could literally come to a customer and say, Shmuel, I'll supply your electricity for $70 a month, as long as you allow me to install these plugs and to operate them in the way that I operate. And then I, as your retail provider, am managing essentially differences in your bill across the months, differences in your, your, uh, your consumption across the hours. But if according over the year, I essentially collect enough money from you to uh, on that you know, $90 a month bill uh, to pay, I kept keep the difference. And I think that's where it's ultimately heading. Well, the prices to devices. Since, yeah, since, uh, go one one final last word. We're we're at the top of the hour, so okay, okay. Um, yeah, last I word. I just Shmuel. wanted to make a comment since you plug in your chapter. We actually have a, now a, a, a project from RPI, three million dollar grant, to implement quality differentiated service based on priority service methodology that we've been working on for forty years and uh, to do it at PJM, essentially to aggregate those curtailment options into virtual power plant and to bid it into the wholesale market. Um, so hopefully that will happen. Now we just have to convince regulators. That's <laughs> the technology is there, the pricing's there, just need the regulators. Well, this has been an extremely fun discussion and yeah, I look forward to the next 20, 25 years in the electricity industry and, and having a similar uh, conversation looking back on, on those years. A lot of changes that we've seen, but, but presumably more changes to come. Uh, so I will turn it, Paul, I believe had some final remarks and then, um, and then David. Yes, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Catherine. And, uh, Catherine, thank you for moderating this session. I know that you're uh, very busy uh, and uh, moving the country forward on, on climate change and energy reform. Uh, I'd like to thank Dick. And Dick, I'm sorry for giving you a hard assignment. I thought you were just going to pull one of the chapters out of our book, Markets for Power. But uh, I guess it was a little harder than that. Uh, and Frank, uh, uh, although it was fast, it was really good. Uh, thank you for doing it. And uh, Shmuel, I want to thank you for talking about the uh, ERCOT system, which uh, uh, has a, uh, uh, a lot of favorable attributes to it. And I, I really recommend that uh, you all read the chapter, these three chapters, as well as the, uh, as well as the others, uh, because they're, uh, they're very well written. In the case of, of Shmuel's chapter, uh, what he and his co-authors have done is have given you a real feeling for what Texas is like. And I can tell you it's not like Massachusetts. Uh, and that's one, the, that's one of the challenges that we, uh, that we face. And let me just close. I, I thought the discussion of retail competition uh, and, and new retail products uh, was really very interesting. And I, I'm kind of in Frank's court in terms of the kinds of contractual arrangements you'd be looking for. But I testified as a graduate student in 1970 at the, Cal at the T Connecticut Public Utilities Commission in favor of time of use prices. And the chairman of the commission was named Miles Standish, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, he kept me on the witness stand for four days, uh, grilling me, uh, very much opposed to any changes in, uh, uh, in, in rates. This was only time of day rates. And I think over the last 50 years, we've made very little progress. Uh, and I, I think it's gonna be very important as we move into a decarbonized system to make more progress because we wanna link the sectors. We wanna electrify electricity, transportation, buildings, the price distributions are gonna change as Dick discussed. And we really need to find a way of linking the wholesale and retail markets, whether it's through, through prices like gritty, or I think more realistically, the kinds of contractual arrangements that and control arrangements that Frank has discussed. I think we need that to make progress or this transition is going to be uh, unfortunately quite inefficient. So thank you all. And I, let me just thank the, the speakers this morning as well, uh, and Jean-Michel for uh, uh, moderating that session. Uh, I thought it was really very, very interesting. Uh, David and uh, Fabian and, and Paul and Chloe. Uh, and together, I, I, I think we uh, gave a good feeling for the, the textbook, which uh, I'm sure some of you feel has been uh, too long, too long in the uh, 
it in the completion stage, but it's going to be out, I think, in November. And uh, uh, we're very pleased for your help. So, so thank you and have, have a good week. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you as well, Jean-Michel and the Florence School of Regulation for bringing about this series of uh, webinars on electricity markets, IAEE. Very grateful for this. Uh, for those listening, you want to tell your colleagues we have recorded this webinar. It will be available complimentary on our website later on today for, for full download and listen. And let me as well remind you of the second series coming out on uh, Monday, November 15th, entitled Innovation and Disruption in the Electricity Sector, What Future for Markets? Thank you once again for listening. And with this, I officially close the webinar.